Hey, Will. Hey, Nada. What are you up to today? I'm at the Mini Canon workshop. Oh, great. So am I. <laughs> so why don't we present our paper, Prolog Style Meta Programming Mini Canon? It's joint work with TR Crump. Sounds fantastic. And for people who want to play, the, the repo is github.com Lamin Meta MK. Hey, Nada, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing great. I just came up with this brand new type system called the Simply Type Lambda Calculus. I found it in a book. Apparently, it's from the 1930s. And I'm very excited about it. And you can see the rules. I sent you the rules. They're there on the right of your screen. Oh, thanks. Yeah. It's, um, it's a pretty slick type system. Only three rules. That's right variables, application, or procedure application, and abstraction, or lambda. And I've got an implementation of those rules, which you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. I've been very excited to try this type system out. We can do, in mini camera, we can do type inference. We can do all sorts of interesting things, actually. We can even do type inhabitation, where we give a type and we try to infer the term or we can say, here's a term and what's the type, but there is a problem that I've run into. So sometimes- okay, let, me, let me check out your file. Okay, all right, check out my file. Okay, so let's see. So I can run this, run the lookup, which is just doing this, uh, looking up a variable in the context. Okay, let's try your examples. So this is the identity function and we get back uh, the identity type. So that's good. And what about self-application? Ooh, well, it's interesting. In order to avoid paradoxes, it turns out that this type system doesn't allow for an applic uh, application of a function to itself. So that x applied to x in the body of that lambda actually isn't allowed according to this type system. So let's see what happens when we run this. OK, we get an empty list. Oh, no. That reminds me of a famous logic programming joke. How many mini Canon programmers does it take to change a light bulb? How many? The empty list. So, well, that's a little unfortunate. It's not unfortunate that we get back the empty list saying that there are no answers, which is correct. There is no type for this term. But the problem is if we're actually trying to you know, uh, do type inference, on a complicated program, that's not a lot of information to go by for debugging. For any program you have that doesn't type check, you're going to get back the empty list, not, not, not anything more helpful than that. So I wonder if there could possibly be a way to augment mini Canron or use a mini Canron technique or idiom or something like that uh, in order to change our type inferencer or put something on top of it so that we can actually get reasonable error messages or a trace of what's going on or something like that. Do you have any ideas? Well, that reminds me of um, the art of prologue. There are some chapters on interpreters and uh, building interpreters for, for prologue clauses. So I think, I think that could work. OK, why don't you show me what you got? So the art of prologue is a great book on prologue, but also on programming in general. And they have chap chapters on metaprogramming, on interpreters, and on um, unfold fold program transformations. And this was our inspiration for the current work. So now we're going to use this work to try to debug why self-application doesn't work in the simply type lambda calculus. Show me. Hey, Will. Hey, Nada. Long time no see. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So I've got a solution using Prolog style meta interpreters. Great. Let's see it. OK, so the idea now is to generate proof trees, such as this one. And here we see in red where, the, where some error occurred. And so we see that to type uh, the self-application, we first type an abstraction. So we put x in the context. 
And already it has unified further, so it knows that X has to be a function because of this self-application. And then that's indeed what's happening here. And um, so it looks it up in the context and it sees it a function, but then it also looks this X up in the context and it sees that it has to be T1. So it has to unify T1 over T2 with T1, and because of the occurs check, it fails to do so. Great. And so we can tell exactly where we failed. Yeah, and, and, and the nice thing is that uh, the explanation you give, the historical explanation for why self-application doesn't work, basically reduce, reduces to the occurs check to avoid the paradoxes. Well, that sounds very useful indeed. Yeah. So let's look at what the code for this uh, for this proof tree derivation looks like. So it looks like this, and it matches the the proof tree. So we just had a simple way of transforming this to the to the to the proof tree shown in the paper, and we can see that here it says that this lookup will fail because it's trying to to uh, to, to find um, the type uh, um, T0, but instead it finds the type T1 to T1, T0 to T1. So basically there are two calls to look up O, which will look up a variable in the typing context, and they have to return uh, two different values that are incompatible because of the occurs check. Yes. Very clear. Hey, Will. Hey, Nada. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Do you have any more examples of metaprogramming using meta interpreters in Mini Kenrin? Yes. So let's look at this graph here. In Mini Kenrin, we can represent it as, the, as this edge relation, which says that there's an edge between A and B, an edge between B and C, and an edge between C and A. Well, this graph has a cycle in it. So if we started asking about paths between two nodes, between say, let's say A and C, there are actually infinitely many paths because you can keep going around that triangle as many times as you want. Indeed. So let's look at the path relation. So here we have defined one. And the base case is if we have an edge between X and Y, then there is a path between X and Y. Otherwise, the recursive case is that we go through some intermediary Z and we have an edge between X and Z and a path between Z and Y. Makes sense. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So here I have to load this example path that I've just showed you. And then I can ask for the, the 10, 10 paths between A and something. And I get, uh, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B. And um, so what do you think, Will? I think we see some duplication there. Yes, and furthermore, we don't want to do a run star because that's what diverges. There are infinitely many answers. OK, so maybe we can somehow remember parts of the paths we've seen before, sort of like a memoization, so that we don't keep redoing the work over and over again. Yes, and that's what we're going to do with the cycler meta interpreter that remembers, records a trace and, uh, and then sees if we've, if we've encountered a goal before. So let's see what, it ha what happens when we run this. And we get indeed this answer here. So um, we have a path between A and B because, um, because there is an edge between A and B. So you can take this path as an axiom. And then we have a path between A and C because we can reduce this problem to finding a path between B and C. And then we have a path between A and A because we can reduce this problem as having a path between B and A and then a path between C and A. Great. And, and we are able to use a run star and prove that there are no more distinct paths. Indeed. And we could even uh, do this for, um, for for any path between anything to anything. And the run star still works and we get a bigger list. 
So Nada, this seems like a very powerful and useful technique. Does this mean that we have to change the implementation of Mini Kenrin to get this meta interpreter stuff working? Not at all. It's all user level. Uh, the idea no. is that we write an we write an interpreter for um, a user defined relation that we reify. So we have this relation expressed as terms as opposed to express directly as predicates in, in prolog, in prolog uh, uh, terminology. So when we're seeing patho in the output of one of these run stars, that means that we have to write a reification relation as an end user relation to see the pathos. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, we provide a macro for this, which is part of our, of our define well. So if we look at the, um, the expat relation, here we see that we're using define well. And it takes here this patho clause, which means it will create this patho clause relation, which is a reification of patho. So yeah, we could define this patho clause by hand. Okay, let's see it. Okay, so let's do it. So the first thing is to, and let me call it my patho clause just to distinguish it. So I take a head and a tail, and the head is the goal that we want to prove, and the tail is the remaining goals that are needed to prove that, that, that head. So for example, then once I have it, I could run it this way. Um, so that's what we'll be able to do, for example. And so how do we write this, uh, this battle close relation? Well, as in here, there are two cases and we want to explicitly match on the goal that we care about. So we can say fxy add equals, and then we have the two closes. So if we have an edge between xy, then we're done because we're only verifying uh, the, the, the path relation and not the edge relation. And if we have an intermediary Z where we have an edge between X and Z, and, a, and then we have what's left is to put in the tail a path between Z and X. Okay, so hopefully that works. So let's try it. Is that relation not recursive? Yeah, it's not recursive because all we've done is verified um, one, like we're, we're just verifying one step of how to prove pathoclose. So in some sense, this relation is not recursive if here patho becomes a term. Okay. But the, the recursion happens here where we have patho in the tail and then it's the role of the interpreter to, to turn this into a recursion. Great, so can we see it running? Yeah, so here we have the output. So what do you think of this output? So if I understand correctly, when we say to prove patho AB, we prove the empty list. What that means is that patho AB is already an axiom because we have a direct edge between AB. But mm -hmm. if we want to prove something more complicated, such as in the sec second line, which you have your cursor on, if we want to prove there's a path between A and some node underscore zero, then we first have to prove that there's a path between B and A. And if we can do that, then we've proved that there's a path between A and underscore zero. Yeah. Wait, is, 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 is that, that right? right? That doesn't look um, right to me. Let's look at the definition again. Um, wait, so if there's an edge between X and Z, 
then there should be a path between z and x that doesn't look right it should be mm -hmm. y let's try again Okay. So if we want to prove that there's a path between A and some node underscore zero, we have to prove there's a path between B and underscore zero. That sounds more plausible. Okay. And, and going back to your point about recursion, we're not also saying that if you want to prove a path from A underscore zero, you can do a path from C underscore zero. This is handled by the interpreter itself, what it wants to do with the recursion. This is only showing the, the first level unfolding of, of the relation. Would it be accurate to say that the reason we don't get an infinite loop when we do a run star is that, it, that our reifier isn't recursive? I think that's fair. If, if it were recursive, we would get an infinite loop there. So somehow we have to break the recursion to get a finite number of answers. Yeah, but there is a natural way to break it, which is following the the logic of the of the original relation and sort of, I guess it's a little bit like trampolining, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So, so I guess one lesson we learned is that a prologue style meta interpreter in many Kenra doesn't protect you from making a mistake, but it is useful. Well, and the the thing is, this is an advertisement for our defined real macro because you we wouldn't have done such a mistake there. I see. So that this uh, keeps us safer. We, yeah. we can't make this class of mistake with the reification. Yeah, so this handles the reification for us automatically. Yes, exactly. OK, great. Define rel is obviously a macro. Is this some sort of complicated syntax case macro? No, it's a syntax rules macro. Let me show you. So here we have the ID like patho, and then here we have the uh, reified IDs, for example, patho closes one, and we might have multiple reified IDs because they might reify different, um, different um, relations. And then here we also have variables that are available at the meta level, at the interpreter level. And then we have the body of the, of the, of the relation. And then all this macro does is to define uh, these uh, CIDs, these reified relations. So for example, it defines pathoclose. And the main way it does this is by um, uh, matching here with the head of the close with the ID and then closing off to the tail when, when it's done. You mentioned an interpreter. So I guess in addition to having the Delphrel macro, which is predefined for us, we're also going to have to define an interpreter to interpret the relations we care about running or tracing or whatever. Yes. So we haven't seen yet a definition of an interpreter, but we've used at least two. So one was for the uh, type debugger. We have a meta interpreter that deals with proofs and how to debug proofs. And we'll show this very briefly. Uh, and then uh, we had the cycler uh, met meta interpreter that deals with detecting cycles. And we use this on the cyclic graph. But let's first look at the vanilla interpreter, which is at the, at the, the template for all interpreters. So, so it's as short as this. And what we're saying is that we have a solver for goals, and it takes a particular clause like pato close, and then it's it uh, it says if the goals are empty, then we're done. Otherwise, we look at the first goal, and um, uh, we look at the at the at the body or the tail of the of the first goal, and we solve the body, and then we solve the other goal. So this is a depth first search style um, interpreter. And it matches the prologue tradition. And we can run it on, on the original um, program, the non reified program, and get the same behavior as the reified program. Does it make sense, Will? I think so. OK, so let's just look to, at the proof debugger, because it's quite interesting, I think. 
and it's 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 not following the rules that Will likes in terms of writing in Canon program because there's a Conde here. No, it's not <laughs> relational. So that's the main thing I wanted to show. We basically try to solve the the program, and if we fail exactly at this body, then we say, okay, we find a, we found an error, and we 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 instead of of completely failing, we return that error right there. And so that's that's the gist of it. I'm not going to go into details. Okay, I see. There's another Conde and proof debug down below. Ah, yeah, that's that's a meta level thing to say. Did it actually succeed or did it actually fail? I see. Good question. Hey, well, so we're done. Wow, that only took 20 minutes. <laughs>